Let us begin this evening with the data that makes us go, hmm. All right, here, this, here is the scenario. You are a decision maker, a policy maker. You work for the health department, CDC, National Institute of Health, or whomever. All right, you find out that the data that's presented to you is as follows. This is basically adjusted survival estimates by index event. Onto the y-axis is survival probability. We have three elements here. Red, legend, or label I should say, is Moderna vaccine. Blue, Pfizer. Green, natural immunity. There is a date from between June 14th and August 21st. Now this is the beginning at the time of the Delta variant. Now here is the conundrum. Natural immunity looks like it does quite well. But, however though, in order to achieve natural immunity, you first have to be exposed. So death becomes a confounding factor. You have to survive the first exposure. Where the weakness in reference to Pfizer and Moderna is, you are basically inoculating individuals which may have never been exposed before. So you have these individuals which are stronger because they've already been exposed to the virus and therefore have a more robust natural immune response. Uh, and then you have individuals which have never been exposed. So it can give you confounding in the probability there. So you see exactly that, where that's coming from. So death can be an incorporating confounding factor in the study itself or the estimates. But now, let us look at the Delta variant in reference to the current popular vaccines. All right, here we go. You ready? Do, do, do. There you are. Red, Moderna. Blue, Pfizer. Green, natural immunity. Now, keep in mind the confounding factors that can play a role in such an incredible, incredible takeaway from natural immunity. Now, here you are as a policymaker. Is the effort to enforce inoculation among those which have proven uh, SARS-CoV-2 exposure and basically antibodies or T cells, B cells, whatever you want to call as far as the immune system uh, in reference to SARS-CoV-2, is it ethical to force individuals which have natural immunity, which is looks pretty much here like it may be superior in reference to the Delta variant, uh, to take a medicine that is not necessarily going to behoove any benefit to them and may even expose them to unnecessary risk. Again, you're the policymaker. That's the scenario. Whatever outcome you decide, that's what your population, unfortunately lacking constitutional liberties, um, has to succumb to. All right, this study, for example, is as follows. It is from, do, 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 it is from SARS-CoV-2 infection versus vaccine-induced immunity among veterans. We'll come back to this in a little bit. Also, as well, keep in mind, too, I want to also stress this caveat. We are partaking in a little bit of selection bias. So we describe it this way. Someone is trying to sell you a car, and you have used car salesmen there. All right, selection bias is searching for problems, and as opposed to just basically taking the word of the used car salesman. So basically, you... You listen to the engine, you check the oil, you kick the tires, you may even take your hands off the steering wheel to make sure the car is lined properly. But the objective here is basically to look for flaws in the overwhelming popular um, dogma. And that sometimes requires a little bit of selection bias. And since most the major media outlets don't seem to want to involve themselves in that element, and so be it, you and I shall. Again, it is 1234 at night, and welcome data analysts, uh, basically biostatisticians, bioinformatics, epidemiologists, data scientists, and policymakers, and of course, our incredibly wonderful uh, data-orientated audience. And so I'll proceed with the first milestone that we're passing, and then we'll go into the data that we're going to, the, the studies we're going to cover. It is now as between January 1st, 2021 and August and October now of 2021, Endura Vigilance bleh, has now passed 
1 million reports filed to it in reference to vaccine adverse reactions. 1 million. And of course, to be accurate, is 1,015,044 adverse event reports have been filed to Durham Vigilance in reference to vaccine reactions in regard to the four uh, COVID-19 vaccines they use, Janssen and Janssen, otherwise commonly known in the U.S. as Johnson and Johnson, Moderna, Pfizer, and AstraZeneca. And AstraZeneca is not used here in the U.S. as of, as of yet. But that's your 1,015,044 between January 1st, 2021 and August August. I can't even say August. October 2nd, 2021. All right, the data we'll be covering as follows is as follows. We saw this. Milk casein prevents inactivation effect of black tea galloylated theoflavins in SARS-CoV-2 in vitro. Really super cool. All right, nasal microbiota holds clues to who will develop symptoms from novel coronavirus. The data is is just amazing. I mean, it is just it is black and white. Now, the question here, without going off on a tangent, is the virus caused the depletion of the microbiota, or are they depleted with the microbiota before the infection? That they got to find out later on. All right, and that's the full study here. All right, uh, I'm not a fan of steroid nasal sprays, but when you get an incredible results, you know, my objective is not really to do to do what I approve of. The objective is if the results are this incredible, then basically, even if I don't like it, then, you know, I like, then I, then I like it. So if it has results like this, yeah, I like it, even though it, I don't normally like it on a regular basis. You know what I mean? That's, that's called, you know, bias, but still I'm not going to be biased at, at, out of basically depriving information or withholding information or not reporting information, which could be a huge benefit to the people. Uh, especially in reference to results like this. But we'll cover that in a second. Da, da, da. And then this was brought to my attention uh, by one of my friends in reference to arginine. And this is from published by The Lancet. Uh, really cool as far as reducing the length of hospitaliz hospitalization or stays, I should say. And it's worth a read. And of course, we'll have all the links to the research on articles as you know when we're done. All right, then the pandemic brain neuroinflammation in healthy non-infected individuals during the COVID-19 pandemic. Now that's interesting too, because if the pandemic mitigation lockdowns and everything else like that is causing neuroinflammation in the non-infected, then all the data in reference to people saying COVID-19 individuals have inflamed, you know, neuroinflammation becomes in question. Because the confounding factor is they're assuming that the COVID-19 is causing a neuroinflammation. What if it's just the environment in which they're mitigating these lockdowns, which has created the neuroinflammation itself, and they're mistaking it as COVID-19? See what I mean? All right. Another one, global burden. Keep this in mind, 2,980 million, nearly 3 million quality adjusted life years have been lost as compared to 20.5 million. Why? Because the well, well why is, is basically because the average age of individual which is, succumbs to COVID-19 is fairly old compared to something like the Spanish flu which the age was 28. And so then we go here, persistence robust uh, humoral, immune response in COVID-19 convalescent individuals uh, lasts over 12 months. Let's just leave that title because that pretty much says the whole thing right there. This is beginning to decline at six months, but it lasts for 12 months. And these are convalescent individuals. And so this is pretty important as far as, again, if uh, vaccine immunity begins to wane pretty fast and people are looking at having to be re-inoculated five months later on, then let's just not play a game. Let's just say about conformity. It's not about winning or losing. It's just that, hey, you know, this is the data, you know, I don't know, just either you, you want data or you don't want data, but here we are. So see next, this is important. SARS, that's a veteran one, we just, just looked at. SARS, you have a dash two, infection versus vaccine induced immunity among veterans. 
All right, and then this one is an extremely important one, which has created a lot of uproar. And it's not anti-vaccine and pro-vaccine or whatever it is. But this one's, I'm going to read you the title and we'll go into it in a little bit. No significant difference in viral load between vaccinated and unvaccinated asymptomatic and symptomatic groups infected with SARS-CoV-2 Delta variant. Now, I'm really curious because, again, I don't get a chance to watch a lot of TV or I should say uh, the news or, or what, i.e. infotainment in a Boolean sense. So I don't know. Did anybody hear this being reported in the news, the newspaper? Because this was actually done. Uh, if you look at, for example, let's see if we could download the PDF real fast, and then we'll come back to it in a little bit. Uh, this was actually done by pretty, pretty prestigious um, universities. And, and of course, here, as my computer is running real slow, there's stuff there just not seen. There it goes. Here it goes. So we're not just looking at, at, you know, people just making things up in their living room and reporting as, as science. That is pretty darn significant. And especially from basically where it's coming from. And of course, there's the Zuckerberg Biohub as well. And, oops, go back to this one again. And this one is huge. But I'm curious, did anybody hear it in the news? Uh, no, oops, get that away. no significant difference in viral load between vaccinated and unvaccinated, asymptomatic and symptomatic groups. Because you know what that means for uh, businesses and other uh, institutions trying to, you know, force uh, vaccinations on individuals under the pretense of reducing transmission. Now, they'll make the argument initially, initially they made the argument, well, those which are vaccinated or inoculated have lower viral loads. So even though they could be breakthrough infections, that generally, well, they have a low viral load, so they have to be, there's going to be less transmission. But no significant difference in viral load between vaccinated and unvaccinated groups, asymptomatic and symptomatic groups with the SARS-CoV-2 Delta variant. That is a game changer. So did anybody hear anything anywhere? You know, regardless, I don't know. But we'll come back to that. And of course, data sources as follows will be used in your durability, your, your, your durability, I don't know why they made the names like that. I wouldn't want to say endure vigilance, your vigilance. All right, we'll be using the GSI, GIS aid uh, database in reference to, uh, oh, by the way, Mu, remember the Mu variant? When we get to that, we, I can't find it. And so like, I don't know what happened to Mu. All right, and then we'll be using our world and data. And uh, just for fun, if you want to look at this real fast, as, as I had it up, this is the daily new confirmed COVID-19 cases per million. There's India. There is the maniacal Australians, which at one time the Australian government, the Australian people are great people. The Australian bureaucracy, uh, yeah, they got problems. And uh, India. Now, the curious part about this, which I always want to bring up, and we'll go back into this in detail. There's the United States, the United Kingdom. And this is cases per million. And so, all right. So here we go. Let's think of it this way. Now, this is it. This is what I want to get to. So look, let's look at, I'm going to use Our World and Data real fast because I think they're a great, great, great site. People fully vaccinated. All right, there's India. There's Australia. There's United States, United Kingdom. Now, what is the one argument made in reference to inoculation? Now, again, it could be confounding factors. So I'm just going to show you the data as stated clean. And that is it. And I'm not going to make any comments. But the one argument in reference to vaccination is reduction in severity of disease and maybe, maybe mortality. Now, look where India is in reference to the amount of people fully vaccinated compared to our other th three, um, I would say, benchmarks. So what is the mortality? Is this the, let's see, I'm looking for, we have to make sure it's the exact same. So this is probably going to be, not to confirm deaths, because you want to make sure it's the same amount of deaths per like 100 people. 
uh, per se. Oh, here we go. Let's not make it so anticlimactic. And let's see, number of deaths, it's probably here anyways. Yeah. Look, where's India? United States? Australia? Oh, Australia. I'll move this aside just so you can see. Dang it. There it is. United States, United Kingdom, Australia, India. Who is the least vaccinated of the group? India. Who has the least case level of basically anybody? India. And so how can that, from an observational standpoint, observational standpoint, I can say that yes, the vaccines and inoculation do reduce the likelihood of death. But now when I say that, looking at the data, do you believe me? If I said, quote, studies show that basically being vaccinated reduces the likelihood of death, even if it doesn't prevent transmission. Now, I say, you're not going to believe me. Now, if someone in power says it, well, again, case in point. All right, let's begin with our data as follows. And also, too, we'll be using the various data set. And again, the basic, we're looking at the various data set. There's a disclaimer. While very important to monitoring vaccine safety, various reports cannot be used to determine if vaccines cause or contributed to an adverse event or illness. The reports may contain information that is incomplete, inaccurate, coincidental, or unverifiable. And there are a lot of errors in the various data sets as far as reports. So, yeah, it can be artificially inflated very easily if the data is not extrapolated appropriately. All right, but let's go right into the research as follows, and let's begin with the first one, which is one of my favorite. All right, no casein prevents inactivation of black T galilated theoflavins on SARS CoV 2 in vitro. I'm going to read straight through, but this is incredibly fascinating and important. Uh, repeated emergence of highly contagious and potentially immunivating variants SARS CoV 2 is posing global health and socioeconomical threats for suppression of the, of the spread of the virus infection among people. A procedure to inactivate virus in saliva may be useful because saliva infected persons is the major origin of droplets and aerosols that mediate viral transmission to nearby persons. Blah, blah, blah. We previously reported that SARS CoV 2 is rapidly and remarkably inactivated by treatment in vitro with tea, including green tea, roasted green tea. Long tea and black tea. Tea catechin derived compounds include theoflavins, TFs, and galoi moiet, moieties, uh, moieties that show this activity. You'll get the point. All right. Although black tea is popular consumed worldwide, a lot of people consume it with sugar, milk, lemon juice, and so on. Let's just get to the chase. Black tea and galoi uh, basically theoflavins, are remarkably inactivated alpha, gamma, delta, and kappa variants. Intriguingly, an addition of milk, but not sugar, lemon juice, totally prevented black tea from inactivating alpha and delta variant viruses. So, to reiterate, if you add milk, this is what the, research, the researchers are saying, if you add milk to the black tea, then it hampers the ability of that black tea to inactivate alpha and delta variants. This effective effect was also exerted by milk casein. The results suggest the possibility that the intake of black tea without milk by infected persons may result in inactivation of the virus and saliva and attenuation of the spread of SARS-CoV-2 to nearby persons through droplets. Clinical studies are required to investigate this possibility. Let's scroll down. Let's scroll down. And this is, uh, check this out, you ready for this? This is the black tea inactivated alpha, gamma, delta, and kappa variants. And this is actually kind of cool. So this is actually kind of fun to show you. This is amazing. Let's make this chart a little bigger. All right, this should be rendering to 4K by now, by hopefully by the time you watch this. Uh, there's part of our aspect as far as the deactivation, uh, as far as the control in the black tea, in reference to certain virus, virus teeters, teeters. Then let's go keep on going. Da, da, da. Black tea inactivated delta variants were diluted in human saliva. There's the inactivations right there. Let's see if I can get that down. It's just, I mean, consistently and amazingly as far as the deactivation. Let's see here. Here's their combination. Uh, see, right there, black tea, cool. Black tea and sugar, kind of interesting. But then black tea and milk, black tea and milk and sugar, poof, gone. As far as what they're looking at there. And then 
Let's see what we got there as far as the dilution in saliva, and you get the point. Because ingesting a tea at appropriate occasions may potentially attenuate viral spread to nearby persons, as we previously discussed, and black tea without milk may be applicable to this purpose. Besides, repetitive ingestion of milk-free black tea shortly after SARS-CoV-2 infection could potentially bring a beneficial effect on disease progression in infected persons because viral application amplification in the oral cavity at the early stages, earliest, earliest stages of infection may play important roles in subsequent viral infection in the lung. Clinical studies, again, are required to investigate these possibilities. So that is just an amazing, amazing outcome in reference to the study in regard to the basically deactivation or inhibition of certain variants. That is super, super cool. And again, the links will be there as soon as we're done with the video. Again, give me some time and I'll have the links there, but then I'll bookmark it where it's in the video so you don't have to go through the whole beginning again. All right, next, this is real intriguing potentially for uh, using nasal sprays that are probiotic. Now, look what happens here. Let's first read the, the general the generalities. And this is called nasal microbiota holds clues to who will develop symptoms from novel coronavirus. And there is a strong correlation. Let us begin. The most significant changes were in those which who were symptomatic, including about half of those patients not having sufficient amount of microbiota to even sequence. Literally. So what ends up happening is the people which are succumbing to the severe symptoms, they, they can't find that microbiota to, to give you a level, meaning level probably zero where they can't sequence. They were surprised to find these low reads of bacteria in the uh, nasal pharyngeal and genial cavity of symptomatic individuals versus only two and four individuals in negative and positive with no symptoms, respectively. The vast majority of the positive individuals with no symptoms still had sufficient mi microbiota. And again, the moist mucus produced, and this is why, the moist mucus producing lining, and let me make this a little bit bigger too so you can see. All right, there it is. Just in case it doesn't run to 4K before you before you read this. The moist mucus producing lining in this area works like a natural barrier to invaders and is also a, is a significant complement of immune cells present. You know, Fusel says, and their response to respiratory viruses is the key. The area is also abundant with ACE2 receptors to which the spiky virus binds. So people don't think of ACE2 receptors in the nasal cavity, but there it is. Now check this out. You ready? Here we go. Do, do, do. Here's the full study. I love when they, pr they publish the full studies. A lot of places don't, and it's problematic. These are the microbiota right there. Uh, we found significantly lower abundance of these five microbiota taxa. And you can go through that right there. And let's see, make that bigger too. Do, do, do. So you can see that just in case it is rendered to 4K. And again, this is real important for medical professionals. And so it's just like you can't take like any probiotic and use it as a nasal spray. So these, for whatever reason, are basically the primary ones they're looking at. And then as we go down, do, 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 not that one, not that one, this one. All right, check this out. All right, let's see. Can you, let's see, can I make that bigger? Those well, too, just in case it hasn't gone to 4K. Yeah, keep on getting the large size. All right, look at this. These bacteria, like the Flectobacillus um, genesia, look, here. These are the people which are basically breezing through uh, the coronavirus. That's the microbiota count. These are the individuals right here. It's the bacteria is non-existent. How can you get any stronger, stronger correlation without actually basically falling into the line of a causative argument when you have individuals? Now here's 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 the question. This is the confounding factor the researchers are looking at. Does the virus wipe out that bacteria? That's the question we wanted to bring to your attention in the very beginning. Or, or basically is that bacteria depleted before the individuals get affected with severe and negative outcomes in reference to uh, SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19? Yeah, that's the confounding factor. But whatever, whatever, the basically at least the correlation, regardless of the cause, is generally that this microbiota, 
freaking vanishes. And so that is an amazing, amazing discovery. And that has to be expounded upon hopefully sooner than later. We've been doing this, but this is, this is I think, is our, we've been 50, 50 videos, 50 weeks of this so far, and about to go, actually 51 weeks. So, you know, I like to see a lot of these, these breakthroughs incorporated into actually uh, nice research that has decent outcomes, per se. And let's see, go down. Let me make this a little smaller. Well, I'll just scroll down. Do, 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 Yeah, that was the end of the study. Again, the links will be there for you regardless. And so this is kind of cool. Again, not a fan of steroid nasal sprays, but that's not the point. The point is it looks like it has a strong effect in producing severe illness. And here we go again. Nasal spray. Where is the ACE2 you know, receptors? In the nasal air cavity. So you see the correlation of events uh, as far as what may be working? It, it, like we've heard saline, iodine, pro, you know, providine, uh, other elements as far as basically being used as nasal mitigation factors uh, over and over again. And here we go now with a medication. Again, it's not, I'm not a fan of steroid nasal sprays, but look at this. Patients who use intranasal corticosteroids prior to COVID-19 illness are 22% less likely to be hospitalized, 23% less likely to be admitted to intensive care, and 24% less likely to die from COVID-19 during hospitalization compared to patients not in intranasal corticosteroids. Compare that effectiveness, let's say, to an inoculation. And see, I'm not anti-inoculation or variolation, depending on what time, zone, you know, time period you come from. But outside of that, I'm just basically saying, hey, why fool yourself? If there are better medications out there to basically treat things, you don't use an inoculation just to prevent severe illness. I mean, unless you have to, unless there's no other treatment. But there's other treatments out there which are better and more effective, then, then, then why? And especially since you're causing a lot of societal strife and people are losing their jobs and just this because they're losing self-autonomy and self-determination and all because of bureaucratic hard, you know, hard-headedness. It's not a game about winning. It's a game about basically helping people stay healthy. And really, really cool link. And again, it pretty much says it to itself. And this is another tie-in. Again, this was brought to my attention uh, by one of our staff members. And... Uh, this is from The Lancet in eClinical Medicine. Arginine. Now, I remember, like, I think it was two videos ago in reference to nitric oxide and how basically the NO2 levels tend to decline. You know, it could be associated, you know, associated with lockdowns and things like that and less public transportation and so on and so forth, potentially correlation. But at the same time, too, they found out that the virus has a really detrimental effect on the NO levels in individuals. And they made a recommendation two weeks ago in reference to L-arginine and citrulline, ironically. And here we are in the Lancet. Now we have arginine. This is a parallel group double-blind randomized placebo-controlled trial conducted on patients hospitalized for severe COVID-19. Patients received 1.66 grams of L-arginine twice a day or placebo. Very, very simple protocol. The primary efficacy endpoint was a reduction in respiratory support assessed at 10 and 20 days. And there's a reason the, the, the 20 day didn't work out, but we'll get to that in a second. Let's just read through here. No treatment emergency serious adverse events were attributable to L-arginine. At day 10 evaluation, 71.1% of patients in the L-arginine arm and 44.4% of the placebo had respiratory support reduced. However, a significant difference was not detected after 20 days after randomization. Why? Because there weren't a lot of people after 20 days. Strikingly, though, patients treated with L-arginine exhibited a significantly reduced in-hospital stay versus placebo. Remember, it's all about flattening the curve. With a median uh, interquartile da, 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 of 46 days in the placebo group versus 25. In the L-arginine group, p-value, really kind of strong if you're into that, these findings were also confirmed as adjusting for potential confoundings, including age, duration of symptoms, comorbidities, and so on and so forth, as well as antiviral, anticoagulant treatments, and so on and so forth. The other secondary outcomes were not significantly different between groups. Hang on one second, I'm going to put you on hold, then I'll be back in less than a split. And I'm back. But here we go. Check this out. All right, however, see, however, a significant difference was not detected 20 days after randomization. 
most likely because most of the participants in the L-arginine arm had already been discharged from the hospital by this time. So here's the irony. Because, look, well, let's look at the data. They were discharged about 25 days versus 46 days. So the irony is that after the 20-day randomization, well, in the L-arginine group, they were discharged. So henceforth, the study had a hard time continuing past the 20-day point without having a large enough study group in order to make a determination. So the irony is the L-arginine worked so well that they could not continue to get the data that they needed to give a strong enough power factor in order to make sure uh, that the study is actually relevant. So let us proceed though down the line here, just to go one of the double charts. Do, 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 do. All right, da, 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 da. And this gives you a good, well, that's like so small. And that gives you a, like right there. Can you read that okay? And there's the L-arginine, and there's the placebo group, and you get the whole picture. If it's small, yeah, that's wonderful. But you see, that's incredible, incredible data. Oh, more information. The multivariate logistic regression performed on the IT population at day 10 of randomization is presented to supplementary material among center. Da, 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 da. Just basically reiteration of the L arginine group being significantly shorter time than the placebo group. And of course, the data as follows. Yeah, can you make that any smaller? Yeah, not actually. Let's see if I can make this bigger. Did that make it bigger? Did that make it bigger? Yeah, there it is. So there you are, length in hospital stay. And there's your placebo group right at the top there. And then your, here is your arginine group in the red line. Pretty cool, simple. 1.66 grams. That is like a tablet and a half of L-arginine twice a day. That is just freaking amazing with a very inexpensive prophylactic. And if that was a drug that someone can make money off of, yeah, you get the picture, but it's there. It's available, and hopefully, if people are watching this channel, which I want to get like a hundred views, like in a, like in a week, this will make a difference to me. If it's all if it's ten or a hundred, but still, you get the picture. If we help one person, boom, we got it made. And it's Kaplan Meyer, and it's your typical your survival curves. Da da. And let's see what we got here. And now it's that's huge. All right, so next now we get into the information which makes us question pandemic mitigation strategies altogether. Again, we are going to be looking at this information. You have to keep in mind this is selection bias. Selection bias meaning we are looking for faults in their arguments. So we are looking for faults in their arguments. But so don't fault me for selection bias because if no one else is doing it, then who else? All right. Pandemic brain, neuroinflammation, and healthy non-affected individuals during COVID-19 pandemic. Let's make this a little larger. Real important here. In fact, accumulated evidence indicates a global increase in the incidence of fatigue, brain fog, and depression, including among non-infected since the pandemic onset, motivated by previous evidence linking those symptoms to neuroimmune activation in other pathological contexts. We hypothesize that subjects examined after the enforcement of lockdown stay-at-home measures would demonstrate increased neuroinflammation. That was the hypothesis. What was the finding? April to June of 2020 compared to the same period in 2019. Likewise, an increase in prevalence of that was just, that was then. Can you imagine now? But still, just proceed. Compared to the same period, an increased prevalence of fatigue, discognition, brain fog, and other symptoms have been reported, including among the non-effective. As such, the scientific medical communities are urgently calling for studies promoting a better understanding of the effects of the pandemic on brain and mental health. Can you imagine places where they have like really maniacal lockdowns like Australia and places like that, which now is, you know, or like even like states in the United States, like Hawaii. Uh, it'd be interesting basic analysis to check out exactly how much damage is being done by bureaucratic overreach. Uh, but to proceed, and it goes all uh, all the things are just very similar. So it makes you wonder, for example, if uh, fibromyalgia and other you know other symptoms such as chronic fatigue syndrome, insomnia, Gulf War illness, and so on and so forth are also beginning to increase. Let's let's go down. Let's look at the charts as follows. Do do. Post-lockdown participants reported experienced various symptoms since the onset of the pandemic, including mold mold. Mood speech disorders, mood alterations, 54%. Mental, 36%. Physical, 
27%. Discognition, 18%. These symptoms were paralleled by a post-lockdown increase. And this is the signal they're looking at, which was apparent in both ROI and VOXA-wise analysis, including support sensitivity analysis performed. I'll just show you the pictures to get the point. Here we are. And so we look at this. So basically, you're looking at the after lockdown, before lockdowns. So you, you see basically the change. I want to see if I get down here. Look down at the bottom. You get an idea. Let's continue a little forward. All right, trying to get that out of the way. There's your signals down below, before lockdown, after lockdown. There is the brains. Look at that. Can you see that? As far as a great amount of inflammation, post-lockdown, pre-lockdown. So when they say that they're messing with your head, yeah, they are messing with your head, whomever they is. But you need an idea. Sometimes when good, you know, the road to hell is, is covered with good intentions. So you have a lot of bureaucrats trying to basically what they – mitigate the virus and but you know they only see things very myopically and that there's tremendous amount of collateral damage outside uh it's not about winning you're not winning against the virus with ice by sacrificing your people all right and then we proceed down and you go through the whole list of definitely uh you know for example fatigue mental fatigue mood alterations so on and so forth pretty significant in their changes but again, this the links will be there. I don't want to uh, uh, basically incorporate or interject publisher bias per se. But however, though, the neuroinflammation among the non-infected uh, is pretty darn intriguing. And it's interesting to look at. Now, that ties in with our next research article. Um, look at the thalamus. Um, so on and so forth. Because... But overall results indicate that pandemic associated stressors may have triggered a neuroimmune response in non affected individuals. Let me finish with this one off first. When interpreting the results of our study, the reader should be mindful of several limitations. First, at a relatively small sample size, particularly compared to basically the cohort, a limitation largely imposed by the COVID 19 pandemic related disruption on clinical research. However, multiple factors provide high confidence in the solidity of our observations, including the consistency of our observations across individuals, scanners, age groups, genotypes, and sexes. So now that ties directly in with the next research article. Eventually, if it shows up, there it is. The global burden of COVID-19 restrictions, national, regional, and global estimates. Here we are. The, a large literature has documented the high global mortality and mental health burden associated with current COVID-19 pandemic. In this paper, we combine newly collected data on subjective reductions in the quality of life with the latest data of COVID-19 restrictions to quantify the total number of quality of life adjusted years lost due to government-imposed restrictions globally. Our estimates, obviously I'm quoting, suggest a total loss of 2,000 980 million quality adjusted life years as of September 6, 2021. To make that simplified, close to 3 billion. According to the latest estimates, 20.5 million years of life have been lost due to COVID-19 to date. So 20.5 versus 2,980 million or 3 billion. 20.5 million versus 3 billion. The direct economic cost of COVID-19 measures has been estimated at 7.7 .7 trillion for the U.S. alone. So you think about it. Here they're arguing about this three and a half billion dollar trillion, you know, three and a half trillion dollar stimulus package, which is an unbelievable amount of uh, money as far as increasing the M1 money supply which is just going to devalue the currency that people have. So people making $15 an hour, it makes no difference if the, it makes, you don't understand, it makes no difference if you have a $3.5 trillion bill, it makes no difference if it costs you nothing. But it does, it costs you a tremendous amount because by injecting $3.5 trillion in wealth into basically the economy, you're creating more dollars, which devalues 
the dollars that people are holding on to. So I mean, you may not understand. Think of it like a pizza pie. You have one pizza pie, which is three feet in diameter, all right, and you have eight slices. And someone says, you know what, I need a pizza that has 16 slices. So the normal mentality is you think, well, if it's a three-foot pizza, then it's going to be a six-foot pizza, right? So it's going to be a bigger pizza. No. So the person at the counter says, all right, you want a 16-slice pizza? They take your eight-slice pizza, and they cut it into 16 slices. But it's still the same three-foot pizza. Now, you increase the money supply, so you're making $15 an hour. Well, we'll only throw three and a half trillion dollars in the economy. Now your fifteen dollars an hour can't buy a freaking loaf of bread. So that's what happens. You increase the M1 money supply, you, de you devalue the amount of wealth available in the current society. So seven point seven trillion, unbelievable. Now, do, you, do I talk about economics? What does that have to do with health? Well, when you're working your butt off to pay rent and you have hardly any disposable income beyond that it tends to make life a little challenging. And that plays a huge role in health. But to proceed down the line, ba -ba 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 -ba. all right, let's see. And you'd be surprised. These are the areas which are really heavily hit. Uh, the United States has been hit hard, but obviously not as hard as other parts of the world, which many of those years of quality of life, adjusted life years have been lost. And so we go down the line here. Now this is intriguing. I like this little article. They did a little survey on here too. Check this out. This shows that across all countries, subjects are willing to give up 22% of their annual salary to avoid school closures. Let's make this a little bigger. Let's see. And 21.8% to avoid closures of restaurants, bars, and clubs. And the lowest, basically, cost, whatever it is, willingness to pay, sounds like a ransom, doesn't it? Uh, was observed for removing travel restrictions. 7% wear a mask, 2%. You know, that, you know, I exercise quite a bit. So basically, that 2% thing, I'd probably be more like willing to pay 22%. But it looks like a ransom note. How much will you be willing to pay to avoid closure of restaurant, bars, and clubs? One-fifth of my income, of course. So you see what I mean. Proceed. Despite the impressive progress made with respect to COVID-19 vaccinations in many high-income countries, non-pharmaceutical interventions, otherwise known as MPIs, for those not familiar, remain a key and in many low-income countries the main strategy to control new outbreaks of COVID-19. In this paper, we show that the societal burden of these measures amounts to almost 3 billion quality of life years adjusted as of September 6, 2021, which corresponds to 38 times the estimated number of life years lost due to the epidemic so far. Have any of you seen this report in the news? I don't care if it's on the radical, you know, freedom side, which basically there's no such thing as radical freedom. You're either free or not. So I, I'm, I side with freedom. But you know what I mean. Or the, the over-exuberant. Uh, or the very, very pro-lockdown side. How else, how else can you word it? Pro-lockdown, anti-lockdown. See, that's the thing, is this great information out there, which you know can be often discarded because it's being tied to a conspiracy theory. To question a vaccine means that you're anti-vaccine. And then they'll tie some of the weird thing in there, for example, you know, like microchips or whatever it is. And therefore, it discredits the entire argument about questioning whether that vaccine has efficacy. Very, very simple psychological strategy which has been used for years. Um, it's kind of like when they had the uh, Occupy Wall Street movement. And then there'd be these weird people that come into the area and start busting up Starbucks windows, which I don't know what anybody has about Starbucks, but every time there's some sort of protest, Starbucks seems to get the brunt of it. But you get the idea. It, it discredits the movement. And so there's all these little discrediting elements being interjected uh, which are basically outlier hypothesis, we'll just call it that way, and as opposed to conspiracy theory, that discredit the movement even to question the efficacy of a treatment. Now, when you look at which corresponds to 38 times the estimated number of life years lost due to the epidemic so far, has anybody, anybody seen that mentioned in the news and media anywhere to date? Ask yourself why. Or proceed down the line. Do, 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 do. Yeah, that was the end of the article. Here we go. Next. Persistence or robust humoral response. Ah, that's in the title. You see what it there? All right, next. It's, it 
we, we know, we know. All right. SARS here with actually infection versus vaccine induced immunity among veterans. That's what we opened with that one chart. But let's go down the line out of respect for the researchers. With over 40 million cases of SARS COV-2 infection reported in the United States in discussion of both vaccine mandates as well as boosters ongoing, we aim to examine, I'm quoting of course, protection conferred by previous infection compared with vaccinations so that citizens and policymakers can make informed decisions. You know, citizens and policymakers. I honestly don't believe that policymakers read anything uh, recently at all. I, do, I don't. Because this has been going on for a long period of time and a lot of the mitigation factors could have been, had a lot of softer touch to it, which could have made societal congruity and harmony. And it's, it's, it's about winning. And I don't like that. But here we go. Among young adults, the protections offered by vaccines were statistically equivalent to that provided by previous infection, especially in terms of absolute incidence rates. Conclusions. Among the elderly, 65 or older, two-dose mRNA vaccines provide a stronger protection against infection, hospitalization, and death compared to natural immunity, um, natural immunity, end sentence. Among young adults though, young adult, 64 or younger. So again, the, the, the wording there can have some confounding because you're thinking young adults. Well, young adults, 64 or younger, qualifies as young adults. The protections offered between natural immunity and vaccine induced immunity were similar. Prior to these actions, an Israeli research group found that natural immunity confers longer lasting and stronger protection against infection, symptomatic disease, and hospitalization caused by the Delta variant of SARS CoV 2, compared to the mRNA two dose vaccine induced immunity. Their finding was alarming. Never infected people who were vaccinated in January and February were 6 to 13 times more likely to get infected than unvaccinated people. I am going to reiterate that. Are you ready? I want to read it slowly. Their finding was alarming. Never infected people who were vaccinated in January and February were 6 to 13 times more likely to get infected than unvaccinated people who were previously infected with coronavirus. So keep in mind though, they are comparing natural immunity from individuals which have been infected prior as opposed to individuals which are vaccinated. That's where the confounding can play a role. So you have to keep that in mind to get a good balance and not to mislead and misread because you, you know, if we take a person that's never been exposed to coronavirus, I don't know how, what the results would be. But people that are exposed to coronavirus prior who are not vaccinated fared extremely well compared to those who were never infected and vaccinated. So again, this plays into the policy making decisions. Uh, a lot of people, the healthcare workers, which are on the front line, who have been exposed over and over again, and now they're being rewarded by saying, hey, uh, if you don't get this inoculation, which may not be necessary, uh, then we're going to terminate you. There's going to be some massive lawsuits because they're making information, these policymakers, whoever these company owners are, without adequate data. And they're creating a form of discrimination based upon uh, ignorance, uh, you know, basically imposing their will on individuals unnecessarily. Uh, they, they'll, they will get what they deserve, you know, legally. Let us proceed as follows. And... Let's sit down. We found that relative protection offered by natural immunity versus vaccine-induced immunity differed by age. Although the data showed most additional protection by mRNA vaccines among the elderly, among young adults, was mostly seen less protection by mRNA vaccines. Nevertheless, in terms of absolute infection rates, the protection was similar as those previously infected. Immunosensitivity among older people could impact the ability to respond to infections and maintain long-term immunity that was acquired either by infection or vaccination. By focusing on July and August during the prevalence of Delta variant reached almost 100% in the U.S., we intend to study the impact of Delta breakthrough infections. Unfortunately, this approach is ecological by nature, owing to a paucity of whole genome sequencing data in the United States. Individually, vaccine effectiveness has been reported to wane over time and can enter a particularly less effective period after five months. 
So you know what? That's why I always say five months is the time. You have to be – it's not going to be six months. Most likely if they keep on the um, – focusing on the one type of pandemic mitigation strategy of inoculation because it just seems to be a gain that wants to be won now, uh, that in order to have the ineffectiveness, it's going to be you know, maybe vaccinated twice one year, three times the next year, and so on and so forth. You can see that how in order to maintain any sort of uh, resistance – uh, but however, let's proceed. Now that was our that was their first chart. So you see right there, natural immunity, Moderna, Pfizer. All right. Now the next one, death is an important competing risk as one must survive the first infection to become a risk again for another infection. Remember we discussed that. The sharp rise in infections among the vaccinated during July and August could be attributed to the impact of Delta. The waning effect of the vaccines and the relaxation of public health measures in the United States are the May most reinfections occurred during the fourth month after previous infection. It is possible that reinfected patients have residual positive da, da, This could change the picture somewhat. All right, we put that into play. And there's our picture. Natural immunity, Pfizer, Moderna. Again, I don't want to read into it and inject publisher bias, but the links will be there. Now to our next article. This was, has a lot of velocity as far as being picked up and retweeted you know, or Facebooked or shared, whatever you want to call it. No significant difference in viral load between vaccinated and unvaccinated and symptomatic and symptomatic groups infected with SARS-CoV-2 Delta. We already covered basically who were the researchers and the institutions that did it, and these are heavyweight institutions. To begin just with the synopsis, we found no significant difference in cycle thresholds between vaccinated and unvaccinated asymptomatic and symptomatic groups infected with SARS-CoV-2 Delta. I am going to reiterate it slow because it is very Boolean and straight to the point. And that's exactly the way the outcomes should be. We, quoting, found no, as in none, significant difference in cycle threshold values between vaccinated and unvaccinated, asymptomatic and symptomatic groups infected with SARS-CoV-2 Delta. So, once again, remember we last week when we covered we're testing unvaccinated people through the roof, but vaccinated do not require to be tested. That creates a very, very weird imbalance. If this information here is valid, and let's scroll down and see if I had any more data here. Yeah, here you are. There was no statistically significant difference in mean CT values of vaccinated versus unvaccinated samples. In both vaccinated and unvaccinated, there was a great variation among individuals with CT values and a dot, 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 dot. Similarly, no statistically significant differences were found in the mean CT values. Go on and go forth. You get, you get the point. I'm going to scroll. Here is where it gets interesting. Are you ready? Let's make this a little larger. Uh, make it super big. All right. Over 20% of positive vaccinated individuals had low CT values, real important observation. Remember, the lower the cycle value, the higher the viral load normally. A third of which were asymptomatic when tested. This highlights the need for additional studies the immunological status of such vaccines escapes and how infectious they are. If, if such individuals carry high loads of active virus, Asymptomatic vaccinated individuals may increasingly contribute to the ongoing pandemic as a proportion of vaccinated individuals grows. All right, and that's all I need to say. And the links will be there as follows. And again, this will probably be used in quite a bit of ammunition in reference to mandatory vaccines because now it is study after study after study, which is, which is confirming one after the other after the other. Now, again, this is selection bias. You will find other studies which will be in favor, obviously. But however, though, the heavy hitting institutions, which are actually, which are coming out with the larger outcomes or larger groups of researchers involved in the projects, seem to be waning. Waning. We'll use the word waning because that could be a popular word now. The, you know, waning is now coming into you know the vaccine thing. Virtue signaling was a, it was unheard of practically a year and a half ago. Now virtue virtue signaling is everywhere, but that'll play a huge role in a lot of the lawsuits to come and or litigation to come. You'll see. 
All right, now let us begin with the data analysis as follows. I'm going to reiterate the disclaimer. While very important, let's make it bigger again. While very important in monitoring vaccine safety, various reports alone cannot be used to determine if a vaccine caused or contributed to an adverse event or illness. The reports may contain information that is incomplete, inaccurate, coincidental, or unverifiable. And there's no doubt about that. However, though, there are a freaking ton of vaccine adverse event reports submitted to VARES. And so I want to cover through it real fast. Da, da, da. All right, let us begin. We're going to start with the Endura Vigilance, since we hardly start with that. All right, this is the number of reports to Endura Vigilance is one over a million now. We break it down. Let's say that we pass that thing. This is the number of severe reactions reported to uh, Endura Vigilance, 446,203. And it's not that Janssen is safe. <laughs> it's really weird because check this out. It's the fact is that there's uh, half the, it's just not a lot of, not a lot of Janssen vaccines being administered. All right. So you see what I mean? AstraZeneca, Pfizer, Moderna. Now, for example, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot more uh, events reported with Pfizer, for if you look down here. But however, though, the AstraZeneca it just has a lot higher proportion of serious adverse events. In their AstraZeneca, I don't think there was any reports of myocarditis in Young, and since California now on its uh, on on its you know on I don't know why uh, started making mandatory vaccination for 12 year olds. The one advantage AstraZeneca had over Pfizer was the fact that uh, they couldn't find myocarditis. And so if I was to make, man, if I was a policymaker and make mandatory vaccines, I would wait till AstraZeneca was approved in the U.S. and recommend this one for children since it has it seems to have the least uh, detrimental effect on the young as opposed to the potential risk of myocarditis from the other ones. All right. That's the number of uh, mortalities reported. Uh, basically, that's the reasoning why. Uh, in the Dura Vigilance, that's the word cloud. We'll pass by that. All right, and we'll just go down the line. And this is, it's interesting how the reports are in uh, Europe. Uh, the most common reports mentioned, uh, basically in reference to vaccine adverse event reports being reported to a Dura Vigilance. All right, now let's go to I'm going to go to the, this one here first. This is just to give you an idea of the zip file size. All right, now keep in mind, this is the various zip file size in comparison. I want to show you real fast, just give you a real bearing for those not familiar. Uh, we look at this and we go to our various site. If you look right here, 2021, that is the file size just of 2021. To put in perspective, this is all the vaccine adverse event reports from January 1st of 2021 to basically September 24th. And so if we look at here, and I just I just have the date automatically pop up because I was so rushed for time when I'm doing this. That's you know it's not, that's not actually September 4th, not October 1st. So that's our comparison. So if we take all the data right here. You add all this up, bump, 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 from 1990, all right, to 2020, you still do not have an equivalent amount of reports as just up to January to September 24th this year. That is unprecedented, historically, on a huge scale. So this is, you know, if so you're a scientist, researcher, or a politician, or whatever it is, I would start backing away from this argument very slowly, because you don't want to be hand, uh, holding the bag as the last person uh, promoting mandates, especially the people's children, Newsom, uh, in reference to, you know, never bothering to look at the various data set. Uh, out of um, voluntary ignorance. That's amazing. And again, how many of these are inaccurate reports? I don't know. Again, does the CDC have the personnel and staff to basically go through this? I don't know. Because that's 2021, and that's all the other years combined. All right. So let's begin for expediency. All right, we looked at Europe. Let's go to Veras now. We're in the Veras. Let's see if the database is loaded yet. Give it a second. There we are. All right, let's scroll down. I'm just going to scroll down to the synopsis. 
All right, because you look at the serva and everything else like that, let's now stop with the myocarditis, and you'll see what I did at the bottom here. All right, myocarditis is still pretty heavy duty in the young. So 5,389. All right, so let's keep on going. Don't worry, I'll go through all this at the bottom. You'll see what I did. All right, there's duplicates as far as in the, in the data frame, which could really mess you up if you're not careful. All right, scroll down, scroll down. Uh, these are the vaccine reports. We're now at 583,564 reports in the United States to the VARES. So these are vaccine reports to VARES, all right? Uh, vaccine reactions reported by age to VARES. Mortality reported to VARES. Needs verification, 7,199 reports to VARES by weeks, all right? I'm just going to scroll down for expediency because I've been trying to get down. It's already 60 minutes. Dang, I was going to try to get this done within under an hour. All right. This is, remember we did this in the beginning? This is 583,564 reactions in 2021 so far compared to 2020, 57,115. And remember, this can, this includes part of the uh, the vaccines in December when they, just, when they were just starting up on a very, very low scale. But still, it's like, whoa. So that's 2021 compared to 2020. All right, just scroll down. Our word things, all right, top reported symptoms in all ages. All right, obviously headaches, fatigue, chills, dizziness, pain, nausea, and so on and so forth. All right, we go down. This is the top reported reactions and those that succumb to whatever. Um, COVID-19, quite a bit. And you'll see this too at the bottom. COVID-19, it could be either breakthrough infections or whatever it's you know if you're not using mrna obviously is not gonna there's nothing there to cause people from getting you know cause COVID 19 but as we read in other articles doesn't mean it can cause variant preferences that makes sense all right but here we are very i don't want to say anything that's going to get us censored you know what i mean all right here we go Lot number reports. This is the problem. Most lots with the most reactions tied to them. Very easy to farm the database in order to find that out. Uh, children, most common uh, reported things in children. Uh, chest pain picks up real big time. That's where again they weren't finding that in AstraZeneca for children. That's why again if if they're going to be maniacal about it, I regret they don't, they don't uh, rush the approval of the AstraZeneca, which uh, that's been used in Europe heavily because, again, that one thing in myocarditis is interesting. Even though clots tend to be higher in our AstraZeneca, I'm focusing on the young age group, uh, not the older age groups, for children. Headache, dizziness, uh, fatigue, chest pain, nausea, you know, all the way down the line, confusional state, uh, immediate reactions, all the way down the line. And so that's most common reports in children to VARES. All right, scroll down. Do, 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 do. The reactions by vaccine. No, hardly anybody got vac vaccinated before October, but you see the reaction reports. You see that percentage going up there. And then what I did here, uh, looking at the average days of reaction reports. Ah, darn it. And what I did here is basically, what do we have? Oh. Let me fix this real fast. Da, da, da. Please forgive me. I just found a little, little hole in the problem here. All right. So what we did here is we broke down the reactions into a bar chart. So not necessarily showing it by age, but let's see what pops up here. And so by doing it this way, it gives a little bit better synopsis of the reaction reports by condition. And these are going to be the conditions which are going to be most uh, that we're focusing on. And so, as you can tell, it's taking freaking forever. And by looking at what we're focusing on, we always could add a little bit more. So it's, it makes it a little easier for the synopsis. Let's give it five more seconds if it doesn't come through. Yeah, it's still going. All right. Give an account. Get ready to pause it. And when it comes up, then, oh, there it is. Bingo. All right, so there it is, you see? Vaccine reports of interest submitted to VARES from January 1st to basically now. And see, this they could have been infected ahead of time. There's a lot of confounding that could be involved in the COVID uh, breakthroughs. But thrombocytopenia, serva, shoulder reactions, paralysis, 
Uh, I should get, I have the index on there. Forgive me, I'll fix that in a little bit. Myocarditis, Bell's palsy, mortality, thrombosis, shingles, and then of course COVID. All right, so that'll be a little easier when we're short for time like we are right now. And so let's go down to our COVID rebuild. I'll show you something kind of interesting with this. Check this out. All right, remember Florida, how Florida is going to fall off the face of the earth? All right, check this out. Here we go. Do, 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 do. If I can scroll down, there we go. All right, number one, average age of mortality. Start off right off the bat. All right, I, cl uh, yeah, it's cleaned up. So here it is, because there was a little bit of a crossover. Let's make this a little bigger. Do, do, do. Bigger. There's that. All right. That's the average age. And I, I really have a problem with when you have large, just large scale of mortality uh, past the average life expectancy. And because I think it leaves us way open to confounding. But it, look at the drop off. I mean, once it's below 65, I don't know how just like one year, 64, 65, they got to break this group up into a little bit more uh, distinct levels. And it just drops off. And then you go to the younger years. And this is a CDC report. So if you think there's more than one, one to four uh, year old children that succumb. That's not me reporting it. That's just straight CDC data. And so, yeah, that's what we're looking at over the, you know, for since the beginning. All right, let's begin. Do, 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 do. Check. I want to show you Florida because it's interesting. All right. Don't pass that. Da, 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 da. All right. Scrolling. Da, 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 da. It's, look at Washington. Look at all these states which are heavy duty lockdown states. Can you say dysbiosis? It's really weird. Look at Hawaii. It's like, oh yeah. It's like, wait a second. It's like, no, I don't. Th I think they have to reevaluate their lockdowns. All right, but here we go. Do, 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 do. Uh, deaths per hundred thousand. And if you look right here, you know, this is really frustrating because remember, deaths per hundred thousand back in May were three point oh six. And, you know, it was higher without a doubt, but I think it's just like the tide. So we close this down. Do, 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 do. You know, let's make it this way, right? Let's just do right here. A week, four weeks, year to date. And that's all. So you can see the trends. That's new deaths per 100,000. All right. Now. There's our basic graphs, but I want to show you this way. Ready? Here we go. All right, here we go. All of a sudden, for whatever reason, I have no clue what happens. But if you look at the, the algorithm here, look how basically it goes up and then drops. Now, check this out. You ready for this? Now, Texas, we know Texas has a problem with an immigration issue, which basically is creating a confounding in their infection rates. So, you know, when people are crossing, you know, for whatever reason, and I don't want to get political, but if they're coming in and they're coming in positive for COVID, then I don't think then Texas is getting hit uh, or mortality per 100,000. So let's see real, real fast. Here it goes. So you, it, it makes it tough to basically analyze the mitigation strategy if, they, if there's, if there's uh, different confounding factors. So let's go to, here we are, now closing the days out. Now we're going down to one day. So here is see what we did. So there's our graph, and we're shortening our time, and that's a weird drop in Florida. So focus on Florida, and then all of a sudden, boom, to one day, all right? And so check this out. Florida is at 0.79 deaths per 100,000. New York, where did I just go there? Come on. New York, if I can get it there. It's not showing. Dang it. There it is. 0.86. So 0.86 deaths per 100,000 in Florida is 0.79. So you see how the fast the tide changes? Florida is actually doing better on its mortality rate than heavy-duty lockdown New York. Think about that. Think about that. That's it just, it's, you know, again, there's tons of confounding involved, but still just the same. Think about that. You're the policymaker. You don't want to get stuck holding the bag because data, hyperbole is great. And a lot of things make sense. But in the real world, does it really make sense if the 
basically the data is not supporting the mitigation strategy. Why create misery and collateral damage if it's not making a bit of difference in the world? And so we go back one week. Look at that drop off. Four weeks. You, know, I mean, does it, did anybody in the media mention this? I don't know. Again, why? Why not? All right, but you see what I mean. All right, let's see. Proceed down and, um, yeah, not much else out there really as far as that. They're just fun stuff. All right, let's continue forward. Mutations. All right, here we go. And I'll show you India real fast, and we'll close it out. But because I want to get done before in the next five minutes. All right, give it a second. If it pops up, do do do. There we are. All right, look there. India positive rate. Oh no, it's our deaths per million right there. See? Now I'll scroll back up. Delta is the variant. The United States, the vaccination level. Fully vaccinated United States. All right, do you see that? Um, positivity rate has not declined. Deaths per million, U.S. And again, there's your variants and everything else like that. So let's scroll down. Deaths per million, U.S. Positivity rate. Fully vaccinated, way up there. Right there, you can see the, the chart right there. India is our control because they just, they're not really getting on board the vaccines per se. They're still doing it, but it's slow. Uh, deaths per million compared to US. Positivity rate, yeah. What do you think? What do you think? Uh, let's go scroll down. That's its fully vaccinated rate. Right there, as we showed you in our world and data ahead of time. Sweden, very little lockdown. Sweden, you know, oh, the, you know, they're gonna fall off the earth. Remember, because I used that because Fauci used as as a bad example, and they kept on predicting their failure. Deaths per million, Sweden. Point, what do you think? Point six. Compare that to the United States now, which was lockdown mania. Oh. So U.S. is about 5.7. Sweden, if this was a court of law, you know, it would be a tough case to prove that their lockdown measures uh, in the United States have actually done anything, except make people miserable. Uh, positive rate, Sweden, and still continuing to make people miserable by creating divisions which are just un unfathomable. Um, and fully vaccinated, yeah, they're actually doing pretty good on the vaccinations. But again, you have to travel in Europe. That's part of the game you got to play. And then let's see, do, 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 and here we go. What happened to Mu? So we have Delta, all right? But look at Brazil. Remember Brazil had all these other variants. Now, where are the other the variants gone in Brazil? So look at Brazil, and we'll use that as a benchmark. Then they have Gamma right there, but where'd Mu go? Mu, uh, as far as September 20th, there's Delta, of course, the states of the, you know, the country with Delta. Uh, all of a sudden, it just began to vanish. And there's Brazil. Remember Gamma? Look at Gamma. Remember, Gamma was ravaging Brazil for quite some time. And then it's just all of a sudden dropping as Delta is becoming, you know, viral pathogen replacement is kicking full bore. And then there's Mu. So Mu, at least as far as the data from the GIS aid, was last spotted. Uh, September 6th, and because it was in the paper and stuff like that, so I wanted to start following Mu. And Mu, you know, is not there. So as we proceed forward, going down the line, and then there's Gamma, and, uh, you know, all over the place. You know, Gamma was high in Brazil, Gamma was high in Chile, then all of a sudden just Gamma is going away. And so it creates an interesting dynamic. And I don't want to go through all of them to show you, but you could see as far as how alpha was, because remember the vaccine was primarily look at alpha as as far as June 28th, then alpha just vanished. And then like, like boom. And then I don't want to go through the whole list here because of the time it is permitted, but let's just go to the, the bottom section right here. Uh, do we have it? Uh, let me see real fast. Did we have it there? There, 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 there. Maybe past it. Uh, it was just an, an amazing dichotomy. There we are. All right, here we are. Now, this is vac vaccinated. So we're going to go through the synopsis here and we'll cover it. This is fully vaccinated for 100 people as of October 2nd. So here is 0 to 10. 
Now, the countries we're utilizing for the sample are over a population of 5 million with human development index of 0.64 or higher. And so, the case from this is 60 to 100 uh, per people, and you know, you're fully vaccinated, every single soul is vaccinated, or 60, you know, is vaccinated, so obviously highly vaccinated. I can't find any statistical significance. Check this out. Because whatever is a 0 to 10 range, the people that are hardly vaccinated uh, are. You know, it's all across the board. So again, you find statistical significance in it on the global scale, please show me. Reproduction rate, it's like, all right, whatever. And then new cases smooth per million. Zero, remember, this is zero to 10, and this is, you know, whatever. And in fact, it's actually a little bit higher in news cases per million than the other groups as a whole. I don't know. Uh, again, that's just the data what it, as, it, as it plays out, and that's up to us to discover later on. All right, and I think that's about it because it's getting pretty late. So let's look at the data we covered real fast, but boom, boom. But now it's actually later than we've ever been. I think we're uh, an hour and 15 minutes. All right, so let's go. Everybody, we cover. Let's go backwards. Do, do, do. No significant difference in viral load between vaccine and vaccinated and symptomatic groups infected with SARS, UV-2, Delta. Again, if you're a business and you want to uh, – Eventually, there's going to be some class action lawsuits. You know it because that is now the data, if at least from a selection bias standpoint, there's enough substantial data to be collected where if it became litigation, it actually could become very valid litigation. All right. And then the infection rates. Again, if they survive the first infection, natural immunity, it seems to do something there. I'm not going to publish a bias, but let's, let's let the data speak for itself. All right. Persistence of robust immune system past 12 months. We know that global burden. We traded 3 billion quality of life living years for 20.5. Again, it could be higher. You know, know about the pandemic mitigation factors. But so far, it's 38 times higher than, than what's been lost. Probably because the average age of mortality is so high. All right. The pandemic and neuroinflammation. Well, that's happening all across the board. It may not be COVID that's causing neuroinflammation. It may be the lockdowns causing neuroinflammation. Wouldn't that be some interesting confounding? All right, uh, arginine gets people out of the hospital much faster. Very small amount that's being recommended in the, scalp, in the outcome potentially. Uh, steroidal nasal sprays, hey, if it works and it's followed up by future studies, then so be it. All right, diagnostics as far as um, the microbiota of the nasal passage. Yeah, like what happened to the microbiota there? I'd be really curious to know if that disappears ahead of time or if the virus causes that. But regardless of that, it creates a susceptibility or vulnerability to those ACE2 receptors, according to the researchers. And then milk casting and black tea. Black tea is just a winner all the way around. Um, works with seems to be helps, uh, again, establish some sort of um, resistance, at least according to this study, uh, in reference to alpha, gamma, delta, and kappa. Almost said something they didn't want to say there but it holds promise. Just don't add milk or milk caseins. Again, thank you all, our data sources. Again, thank you to the Europeans for their vigilance. Thank you to GISA, incredible. Thank you to our world and data. And honestly, too, again, CDC has to work. I don't know what's going on in the background, but the, the common foot soldier in the CDC um, has you know, you have to give them a lot of credit. I mean, that's a lot of data to collect and so on and so forth. I'm not a, I'm not impressed by the bureaucratic uh, establishment towards the top. Uh, I don't know what they're thinking or how they're thinking. But however, though, the regular person every day at the CDC it seems to be doing a decent job. Uh, even though I'm not necessarily I'm perplexed by the leadership. But being perplexed by the leadership does not mean to discredit everyone else underneath. Uh, so to proceed, and then we got all those studies there, and that's a lot of credit there. Gratitude, thank you, thank you to all individuals there. The data is there too, and it will be rendered in 4K. Get a little bit of time, but once we get it rendered in 4K, everything will be really, really, really easy to read, and it's be like kind of cool. And now I'm just scrolling aimlessly, and it's typically a long goodbye. Again, see you all next time. Ralph signing off. Thank you, thank you, thank you, and I'll catch you next time. Bye.